Let us bow in prayer. Our gracious God and Father, we come to you with grateful hearts, thanking you for all the things you've given us, all the things you do for us, those things which are seen and those things which are unseen. We truly give you thanks this day. We ask you, God, to work in us that we might be strong and that we might do the work of your kingdom here on earth as you've called each of us to do. We ask you also to renew our minds that we might think and perceive the world around us the way you desire us to because of what you have taught us in your word. We also ask you, God, to draw us intimately closer to you than we have ever been. And for those who have never made that decision to accept your great salvation, may they do that this day. We also ask you, God, to work in us, to continue to guide us as a church and as individual people within this congregation. And Lord Jesus, we come to you and ask you to teach us in your word, even as you taught your disciples when you taught them to pray these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Our first epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Our second epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord, and in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let us pray. We ask you, God, to speak to our hearts through your Word, that we might hear your Spirit, and that we might respond in obedience. These things we ask in your name. Amen. I remember as a very small boy, every Sunday morning, we would wake up, we would have breakfast, and we would put on our Sunday best clothing. And we would go to church, and I remember very specifically what it was. I had a little black suit, a lot like what I have on, a white shirt, and a little black clip-on tie. And I thought that was the berries. I remember one Christmas, my grandmother got me a striped tie, and boy, we thought that was just... 
because we wore our suits and our finest clothes to church on Sunday morning. That isn't wrong, and I'm not belittling that at all. We don't do that so much anymore because of the way our culture has grown to think differently about apparel. I see what God says uh, to us in the book of Hebrews as probably the most important thing, and that's that God looks at our hearts. He wants to know what's inside of us, not necessarily what's outside of us, even though what's outside of us can reflect the reverence of what is inside of us, obviously, to God. And I understand that, and that's perfectly all right. Paul writes to the Romans, which is a very familiar text to some people in church history. If you've ever studied church history at all, the passage we read was the passage that led St. Augustine to his conversion to Christ. If you don't know the story, St. Augustine was a uh, basically what we would call a college professor. He was a very dissolute person who lived a very immoral life and was well known for his teaching. And uh, he read the Bible, the scriptures that were available at that time. But one day while he was in Milan teaching, um, he was in his back garden and the neighbor boy across the fence was out playing, a little boy, and he kept singing a song, and the words to the song were, take it and read, take it and read, take it and read. And somewhere in his heart, Augustine decided, you know, this is what I need to do. He goes into his library in his house, pulls out the book that Paul had written to the church at Rome, and flops it open to this very passage, and it led him to faith in Christ. Through all of his misery and dissolution and uh, his perversions and everything else that he was involved in, this text of taking off the deeds of darkness and putting on Christ helped him. And it led him to faith in Jesus Christ and obviously made him the second most quoted theologian in churches, in the church uh, that we quote in history. We cannot wear more than one set of spiritual clothes. It is impossible. Jesus said in the Gospels, he said, um, either you will love one master and hate the other, and you cannot serve two masters. Okay? And because of that, it narrows us down to being dressed spiritually one way. Either we serve the enemy of our souls, or we serve Jesus Christ. And there is no walking the barbed wire fence, as I say. Your feet will get bloody and you'll fall one way sooner or later. So the best thing to do is to make the decision which set of spiritual clothing you're going to wear for you the rest of your life. And do it. Uh, some people I know wear a certain set of clothes uh, spiritually and mentally and psychologically from about 11.30 on Sunday morning until about 10 o'clock. The next Sunday and then they change and become different as they walk in and take a seat in their church that they attend and some of you may even do the same thing it's not my job to judge that or to make comment on it other than to observe it and say it happens and I have to say there are sometimes I catch myself wearing the wrong clothing at the wrong time and I'm not dressed appropriately but if we are going to face the future spiritually and psychologically, we must know what we should wear to walk into those situations and circumstances we will and probably already are walking into. And Paul makes it very clear that we are, if we are to stand firm and stand strong in our faith, we must be dressed in the armor of God, as we would classically call it. And he goes on to talk about that armor of God when he writes to the church at Ephesus. And he uses six different illustrations of a soldier's armor. Okay? And as he does that, we find that five of them are very, very defensive and work to protect us from the enemy. And of course, he goes through this list and he talks about the breastplate of righteousness the helmet of salvation, which is we're saved by the way we think. A lot of people don't get that. It's a choice. It's a cognitive choice. A lot of people think it's just a dial of a 1-800 number 
or come forward and kneel at the front of the church and say the sinner's prayer. And none of that is necessarily wrong or wicked, but it doesn't save you. You have to make the choice. And that's a cognitive thing. He talks about the helmet of salvation. He talks about the gospel shod feet uh, and protecting your feet with the gospel wherever you go. This type of thing. And uh, all of this, he, and he talks about the shield of faith which deflects the enemy's darts. But finally, finally he comes down to one thing. And that one thing is the sword of the Lord, which is the word of the Lord. It's God's word. That's the offensive weapon we have. But see, when you know God's word, you can strike out at the enemy just like Jesus did when he was tempted. When Jesus stepped into the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted of the enemy, every time he was tempted, he did what? He quoted scripture and it was firm in its doctrine so that he knew where he stood and he resisted the enemy. That's important. When we know God's word, we can be people of faith who know how to defeat the enemy, not just be protected and maybe cower away a little bit and avoid a problem, but we can strike out and have victory because of the word of God in our hearts. The psalmist says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. When we have God's word in us, we can stand strong. Just like Paul said, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Where does that power come from? God's word. And if we don't read it, learn it, and apply it, we cannot stand strong. Because that is our, our offensive weapon and the only one we truly have. Very important things to remember as we dress for the future. And we must be dressed for the future. So what are we going to take home with this? Well, first of all, you can't wear two sets of spiritual clothing. You either wear one or the other. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. You can't serve two masters. Either you will love the one or hate the other one. So you dress appropriately for who you're serving. And the ideal thing is to stay dressed that way because we're going to walk into a future of uncertainty in every one of our lives in every one of our situations and in our nation. Okay? We must be prepared to dress right spiritually. And finally, the last thing we need to take home is that God's word conquers our enemies. And I'm not talking about our enemies in the flesh. Because as we read in our scripture, these are, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, we wrestle against spiritual powers and wickedness in high places. Okay? That's a spiritual thing, and we need to be people of prayer. We need to be people of the Word, that know God's Word, that read it, learn it, and apply it to our lives so we have an offensive weapon, because God's Word conquers our enemies every time. He never fails. We can count on it, and we should, as we make our journey into the future, dressed for those events. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your Word. Thank you for everything you are doing in us. We ask you, God, to continue to work in us and keep us prepared for the future. Teach us how to dress properly, spiritually, so that we can affect good, and positive, productive works in your kingdom. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior.